Welcome to episode 184 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and today we are talking about the future of human capital management and HR technology with Stuart Sackman, who is the CIO and the CTO of one of the largest HR technology companies in the world, ADP. Stuart, how are you? Great, Michael, and uh, pleasure to be with you. Well, thanks so much. We really appreciate your taking the time. So, Stuart, just to set context, tell us about ADP and a little about your role. Great. So, uh, you know, as Michael said, uh, my name is Stuart Sackman, and my actual title is uh, Corporate Vice President of what we call Global Products and Technology. And Global Products and Technology encompasses four major areas. Um, our R&D teams, those are the groups that build our client-facing products, and I'll talk a little bit more about ADP in a minute. Uh, so our R&D teams, and then our, what we call our infrastructure and operations teams globally. Those are the people that run our data centers and keep our infrastructure up and running. Uh, we also have a centralized product management team. Obviously, they work very closely with our R&D team. Uh, around product requirements, as well as with our clients and our operations team to try to keep track of what's going on in the market. Um, and then the last group is internal systems. So I also run the groups that um, you know, are in charge of our financial systems. And of course, we use all our own HR, talent, and recruiting products, but uh, I guess I'm, I'm responsible for those as well. So that's the scope of my organization. So your role includes both uh, internal technology, essentially functioning as CIO, as well as external technology or t technology you're developing for external, for your customers to use, and you're therefore functioning as CTO. It's an unusual combination, and can you tell us how did, what, is, what, is the, what are the reasons why those roles come together as, as they do at ADP? Yeah, so uh, for those that aren't that familiar with uh, ADP, um, as Michael said earlier, we're a global human capital management company and we do business uh, in over a hundred countries and we serve virtually every market segment as it relates to human capital management. So we serve very small companies, you know, two or three or four employees, mid-sized companies, large US domestic companies, and the very largest global multinational companies. And 100% of the products and services that we provide are cloud-based. Um, and for the most part, uh, they run in our data centers. And clearly one of the important elements of our services is the overall performance and availability of our solutions for our end user clients. Um, so there's a really very tight handshake for us between the products that, you know, as we develop them to market them and provide them to customers and the infrastructure that runs them. And one of the journeys that we've been on recently um, is we've moved our whole R&D force to agile development. And we're trying to be, you know, as, as everyone is in the market with the pace of change in technology, you know, we're trying to be more agile in the way that we develop things. And, you know, it's an end-to-end -end process. So it's, can't, if we can develop things faster, we can't deploy them and our clients can't benefit. So we think it makes sense to have a single leadership for both the, again, the products, the R&D, the things that we sell, as well as the infrastructure that they run on. So that's the rationale for it. Are there tensions? It's, it's an unusual combination. Are there tensions or challenges that come up uh, where these two, between these two different roles? And the reason I'm asking is because in most companies, they really are so different, even though I realize that at ADP, they're, they're quite converged. Yeah, so there, 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 is a, there always is a little bit of a, there's always a natural tension a little bit, I think, between the developers that are out in front and the infrastructure people uh, developers tend to be a little bit more freewheeling, you know, they're out focused on the next features and, you know, the infrastructure people have to run this stuff and they have to, you know, meet our very high standards for availability and uh, reliability are a little bit more cautious in their pace. And years ago, they actually, we had these two functions separated and there was a little bit of the over the wall kind of 
uh, behavior inside ADP. We develop it, throw it over the wall, someone else would deploy it. And um, our clients suffered in that because we had, you know, we had more outages and, you know, lower performance. So again, one of the rationales for bringing these things together was to, you know, close that seam organizationally. Now, now I wouldn't say, Michael, that it's perfect, uh, but it's significantly better. And we do have a really good partnership. Um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar, so much has been written around DevOps and the things that are going on to simplify deployment. And, um, you know, we have a lot of those practices, uh, you know, we're trying to use containers and newer technologies uh, to simplify our deployment. I guess it enables the agility we need to meet the, you know, the, the changing market trends. So I feel good about where we are today. And I, to be honest, it wasn't always perfect, but it feels pretty good today. You mentioned that you're 100% cloud-based, and I don't think people realize that ADP was was genuinely one of the the pioneers of the cloud. Yeah, we, you know, not a lot of people uh, know, you know, know the history of the company. I'll, uh, I'm 24 years with ADP. I'm a little bit of a historian. I'll just spend a second with you because we created the outsourced payroll industry, and in many ways, we created the one-to-many business model. And as you know, the one-to-many business model is the foundation for cloud services. That's one of the big benefits, you know, as opposed to having running stuff on premise that's customized, you know, where you have to fight upgrades. You know, the cloud offers the, the benefits of, you know, new features come to market faster, um, but it also, you know, you share that with other people, one to many. And, you know, the company was founded in 1949, even back in 1949, before computers existed, we had a one to many business model. The difference was it was a team of bookkeepers and we'd go get, you know, timesheets from companies and we'd have a single team, you know, write their paychecks and then send them back out. Uh, and we've navigated, literally navigated every uh, technology, you know, we've navigated all the technology changes. We were very early users of IBM computers, um, still a big user of IBM computers. And then, you know, when client server and batch processing and modems came around, we started to push technology out into our clients and we connected via modems. And as the internet evolved, you know, we've moved everything to our cloud. and. Uh, you know, we think we're the biggest business to business cloud uh, HCM provider, 600,000 clients globally. Um, and yes, absolutely, all of our applications are delivered over the cloud today. We have a question from Twitter. Arsalan Khan is wondering about your, the impact that your uh, previous uh, background as a management consultant has had on what you do today. Yeah, so my, uh, so my background is uh, I was a management consultant in technology. Uh, prior to that, I actually worked for a startup in the 80s and the first technology boom in Silicon Valley. Um, but, but consulting is, a good, is, good, um, is good training for business because it gives you the opportunity to see lots of business problems, uh, work across lots of companies, uh, trains you in communication and you know, trains you in analytics of problem solving. And um, I think I carry those skills forward as we think about the evolving landscape of technology, especially as it relates to human capital, you know, those skills around analysis and strategy and thinking are helpful. And I think it helps me direct my teams better and keeps us forward looking as far as, um, you know, what we work on and uh, how we try to drive the HCM market forward. I want to remind everybody that we are talking with Stuart Sackman, who is the Senior Vice President and CIO and CTO of ADP. And while we're doing this, while this video is going on, there is a live tweet chat with the hashtag CXOTalk. And so feel free to tweet your questions using that hashtag CXOTalk to Stuart Sackman. Stuart, you are in the unique position of not only being able to observe changes in HCM and HCM technology across a, a range of uh, different market segments, large and small, as you said earlier, but you are also shaping that future. And so please share with us your observations on what's going on with HCM and HCM technology today. 
Yeah, so it's, a, it's a real, actually a really exciting time to be in the human capital management uh, business and uh, exciting for lots of reasons. Uh, the rate of technology change and how technology is being applied to HCM is exciting. And also as companies broadly around the economy, uh, as technology plays a bigger role, um, you know, they're out there trying to recruit new talent and engage their workforces and the tools that we develop, we believe, help them do that. So it's exciting on lots of fronts. Um, but there's, but there's some, I think some, you know, there's some trends that are well proven, like the move to the cloud. One of the things that we think is going on is we think the, um, you know, there's been a lot of work done in user experience and that people have written a lot about the consumerization of IT. Uh, we think maybe the next, uh, we think the next big trend in human capital management is what we call a conversational user interface. So we believe that over time, HCM human capital management solutions will be like automated assistance and the interface will be more conversational. So today when you use a, you know, traditional human capital system, you know, you log on somewhere and you navigate somewhere and you go, oh, who are people and you search people who are my high performers. Uh, we think in the future that could be conversational. So you little, you pick up your mobile advice and the system would be like an automated system. You go, hey, who are my high potentials? And the system would return it back to you or, um, and that the systems would use machine learning to help actually make your life easier, which is the end value, you know, one of the big benefits of systems. So, you know, the system might remind you like, hey, your time card is due. Um, or I know you worked a regular week this week. Would you like me to submit your standard hours for you? Uh, I guess it's well looking at your calendar and it knows you were just, you know, you worked your regular shift. So we think this change to conversational user interface and this idea of more push where there's more notification and conversation with our systems than today's what we describe as poll where you, again, you navigate some menu system and you go down and get the information you need. We think that's kind of a, an interesting way that technology will evolve and we're working on this in our lab and we think it'll, it'll change the way people interface with HR technology. So these, com these conversational uh, user interfaces as you're describing, so it's a combination of rethinking the user experience backed up by machine learning to interpret the data that the system is collecting. Is, is, is that's Correct. Yeah, so you can think about, you know, you can think about, and, and, and this is starting, you'll start to see this in the Mark Save, you can think about the HR system becoming a bot sort of in the background that's monitoring your patterns of behavior and work, as well as on call for you to ask it questions. Um, and, you know, like a good use, like an example might be, you know, it's looking at your calendar and says, oh, Stuart, I see you're going to be in California. Uh, you know, you're visiting your office in California, you have some meetings. Uh, did you know that you have two high potential um, people there, associates there, that are at high risk of leaving ADP? Because I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about our predictive analytics. We have a lot of, you know, we're focused also on big data. So we have these predictive analytics around flight risk. So the bot might say, while you're there, you have these two high potential associates, they're at flight risk. Maybe you should consider meeting them for breakfast or lunch and talking to them about career opportunities at ADP because you know, clearly you want to retain them. And, and today that's really hard to do because you know, when, my, when my admin sets up my appointment, she doesn't know what's going on. She's not searching the HR database. And if it's not top of mind for me, that's something I might miss. That's an example of how the bot would be both interactive and you know, you know, using machine learning. Then as it sees my pattern and says, hey, Stuart loves to have lunch with associates and skip level meetings, then it would learn that and as I do other traveling, it will continue to um, you know, build on that and help me establish those connections within the organization. As you are talking with your customers, what are the kind of expectations that customers, how are, how are customer expectations changing? I'm assuming that, that these technology developments you're describing are in response to to the customer to, to customer expectations and what they what they want from you. Yeah, so I do spend um, I spend a lot of time uh, with our clients. Uh, prior to this role, I ran our global multinational business where I uh, spent the majority of my time dealing with uh, you know our largest global clients. And 
you know, one of their challenges and the challenges of HR that's been around, you know, forever is that there's lots of information in these systems, but it's hard for people to get the value out because they're busy with their regular jobs and, you know, they don't show up and work every day necessarily thinking about what HCM activities or transactions I need to do. So um, we need to make the applications easier. And that's where the push versus pull comes in. So we're notifying them and we need the machines to do more of the heavy lifting around understanding patterns of work and helping, you know, push data to whether it's managers or practitioners or employees, push information to them at the right time so they can take the right actions to keep them engaged in the company. So another area that we're heavily focused on is, um, you know, kind of what we call the study of behavioral economics. So we're looking at how, you know, we're trying to study behaviors and how people behave. And we're trying to redesign our systems around the way people really work, not the way we want them to work. You know, we want everyone to be perfect and engaged and, you know, on time and, uh, you know, do all their HR, you know, clean their room and do all the things they're supposed to do. Um, but the truth is they're busy. So uh, we're studying behavioral economics and we're trying to find lower friction ways to help bring value to our clients that are less disruptive. So again, just so that people complete them. So we developed something that we call, uh, we developed an application we call uh, Leader Compass. And we actually you tested it internally inside ADP with our 56,000 global associates. Uh, and it's all email based. So it's an incredibly light application. There's no registration, no passwords. You don't have to do anything. We start, we send an email and we, we start, the first email is confirm who your manager is. And then you just type reply with your manager's name. And from that, we reassemble the org chart for the company. So again, in HR systems, if the practitioners aren't keeping track, people do move around, especially in big and mid-sized companies. And sometimes just the org chart gets out of date. So we assemble that with, again, no systems install. We assemble that just through email. And then the next thing we did is we did a, a short 12 question survey, like a 360 for your leader with 12 questions. And then we assembled the results and we were able to provide them back again no login no work you know and we got like 96 percent participation because it took you know 10 minutes to fill out the survey and then we assemble the results and we distribute them back to the leaders and we show them on a bell curve how their relative score compares to the rest of the adp organization and then we have an automated coach in the background so as we identify their you know, there's their opportunities, you know, based on the feedback, you know, we register them for coaching and we have a, we call it ADP coach and it sends very brief targeted emails on those specific topics that the leader compass showed that people needed development. And again, we get incredibly high click through rates on the coaching because they're short. You know, we don't know if people, we can't guarantee that everyone's reading it and internalizing it. We know they're at least opening the emails and reading them. And, you know, just that simple thing, no installs, no logins, no work, you have a leadership development tool, basically. And that's where, again, where we think the world is going because today's systems are just still too heavy, too hard to use, navigate and all the rest, so. With your scale, and I should ask you, can you give us a, a sense of how many people actually use your systems? Yeah, so I think uh, it's roughly third. I think uh, roughly thirty million people worldwide use our systems um, in one form or another. Uh, we pay one in six people in the U.S., um, so that's obviously a big population. Um, the majority of our large and mid-sized clients, um, you know, use us for payroll as well as uh, HR and and the talent suite. Um, and we're in business in, uh, I think I said earlier, in 100 countries uh, globally. So at that scale, every time you make a change, it, there's, there's a massive ripple effect that takes place. And so you must be always thinking, how do you balance change and improvement against the risk of disruption and causing change for, for your customers? So how do you think about that? Yeah, really good question. So, 
But we do have multiple systems because we do have different products that serve small business and different products that serve mid-sized domestic and large domestic and global. We have individual country solutions in some of the countries where we do business. So when we make one change, it's typically not affecting all 30 million. Um, but it, it is something that we worry about as we've gone to agile development and we started to you know, deliver in most of our product lines kind of three major releases a year. Um, we do get, um, you know, we do get in some cases feedback both from our clients and our service associates, you know, that we're going too fast. Um, but, you know, we try to solve that through elegant design and making sure that the, the experience itself is easy enough to use so that the changes are generally positive. Um, the other area that's, you know, that, that's also a challenge for us is we have a big service organization and they need to stay obviously well trained and versant on our current solutions as well. So that's another area that we spend a lot of time on. So um, yeah, it's a challenging problem, but uh, you know, the market for HCM, there's, I think there's two or 3000 startups that we compete with and they move incredibly quickly. So um, we have to stay agile to, survive and to continue to compete and win and i think we're doing a good job we're doing a good job at that and uh you know and we're getting better all the time at how we test and release and uh you know sort of feather in the improvements but stopping isn't an option so we just got to keep moving forward so you said that there you compete with two or three thousand startups that's that's an extraordinary number i mean how how do you how do you do that how do you think about them? How do you build strategy around that? I mean, you must feel like you've got arrows in your back continuously. <laughs> yeah. So what's the, uh, I'll go back a little bit and sort of, um, you know, the evolution of, um, of HR systems. Um, if you can remember back to the, uh, you know, the heyday of the um, kind of ERP solutions, you know, and PeopleSoft and Oracle and SAP, you know, they tried to build these gigantic systems that solved every problem for business. And, um, and they got weighted down by their complexity and their cost of upgrades. So, um, you know, it just didn't really work. And then popped up, then what happened is all these sort of best of breeds popped up. I do performance reviews, I do recruiting, and they kind of attach themselves around the ERPs. And then when we made the transition to the, uh, you know, the cloud, again, the, the, the cloud companies that started in these best of breeds, you know, tried to build out the entire HCM suite. So now you try to have this fully integrated uh, solution in the cloud. And, and we've done that as well. But I don't think that's the future of HCM. And um, again, I'm sure people are listening and watching, you know, I've read a lot about sort of the API economy and what's happening around APIs and how systems talk to each other. But our strategy for competing is not to try to do everything. So we have a solution that we call the ADP Marketplace and we publish all our APIs in the marketplace and then we encourage you know, companies, some of these 3,000, they might compete with us in recruiting or in a specific pillar of talent management you know, or in time and attendance and benefits, we actually you know, we try to recruit them to participate in our marketplace um, and use our APIs to connect to us because we can't stop the progress of our clients. So, you know, we have a great performance system that ADP offers, but some companies like GE are dropping annual performance reviews and they want to do check-ins. Well, we may not have, we don't have that capability today and we might not have it immediately. So we want to have a partner in our marketplace. So if you change the dynamic, the way you want to do a performance or recruiting, you can go to the marketplace and get a partner that's integrated. So the way we compete is we try to co-op them in a, this co-opetition thing. We think our scale and our capabilities, our system of record is tremendously valuable. And you know, over time, we may or may not have solutions that compete in some of these pillars, but I don't think that there's you know, this fully integrated HCM suite is going to be the future. It's going to be a core HR with some specialized solutions that will differ broadly by clients. Because what the clients tell me is, hey, we want our solutions personalized around our needs. We don't want to you know, just use your out of the box. We like portions of it, 
but other portions we want to get from elsewhere, and we want to enable that. So your so your argument or your view is that smaller smaller I was going to say components. It's probably not the right word. Smaller applications that are more uh, finely grained and tailored to the needs of narrower segments of users, and then stringing those together through APIs. That that's really the future of HCM. That that's where I that's that's our belief. And um, as we our marketplace is growing rapidly, and you know as as our marketplace grows, I think others will be forced to also. Um, move in the same direction. Because again, as I said, it's not just that different companies might have different ways of doing certain HR tasks inside an individual company. You might want to do things differently. So in our, you know, in, you know, we were building up, we have an innovation lab in Chelsea in Manhattan. And when we're building up the lab, we're trying to hire a very specialized, high technical person and we had a lot of open positions. So our standard recruiting processes aren't a good fit. So we needed a different system to support the way we recruit for that group in that location. And again, many of our clients say the same thing. They have things that are going on that are unique and some of those unique activities require a unique solution. So while the bulk of ADP might use ADP standard recruiting system, this division or this department or this location needs something different. And they might use that for a couple of years and then go back to the standard. So the world is so dynamic again and things change so quickly that if we don't create the marketplace and the APIs and we don't find ways to, you know, um, to include the startup community, I think, you know, we're afraid, you know, the world will be left behind and, and, and equally important our clients won't be able to get the full benefit because they won't be able to, it'll make it too difficult for them to leverage the tools if they have to do all point to point integrations and all the rest is sort of the heavy lifting of technology connectivity. So really the goal then is uh, greater simplicity and ease for your clients, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, again, my vision of this is mass personalized. So we have this in the consumer space, right? Um, you know, you might have an iPhone. I have an iPhone. When I go to big groups, you know, a lot of people have iPhones, but no two people have the same sets of applications on their iPhone because we've personalized them around our needs and individual applications change over time. You know, I used to use whatever MapQuest, then I use Google Maps, then I use Waze. And, you know, I don't have to throw out my phone. I just get rid of that component and I don't have to change my calendar and, you know, my contacts and all sorts of other stuff. So, you know, our technology design is actually based on that. You know, uh, we think, you know, that app these, you know, what are now these bigger, more integrated applications will go to a series of mini apps that share a common platform because your HR, your org structures has to be shared. You know, the workflows and approvals have to be shared because that's, that's common to the organization as whole but the individual way you do a performance review might be different in different segments and it might change over time. So we think, you know, this platform common set of capabilities with mini, what we call mini apps or, you know, smaller applications for discrete tasks is the way the world's going. And it's so consistent with the consumer experience that, you know, we think it'll be a very comfortable thing for our clients, especially as millennials become a bigger part of the workforce. I want to remind everybody that we are talking with Stuart Sackman, who is one of the senior leaders at ADP. And there's a tweet chat going on with the hashtag CXO talk, and you can send questions in for Stuart. Stuart, these changes that you were just talking about, do they fall under this general broad category of jargon that I don't particularly like, but we all use, uh, digital transformation? Yeah, I mean, um, it's sort of a, it is sort of a, it's sort of an all-encompassing term, digital transformation. Um, I, I guess the answer is yes, in the sense that they're all enabled by technology and they're digital, you know, in nature. Um, you know, again, we've been in the, you know, we're as I said earlier, you know, we're in the cloud or a cloud-based company. All our products and services are already technology-based. So I don't know if that's, you know, per se a digital transformation with us, but it's the way technology can be 
deployed and used is, you know, is changing. So we do think about, you know, wearables and how we, you know, how notifications could work. Uh, we have big efforts in machine learning. And I talked about earlier, you know, trying to recognize patterns so we can push information to managers and practitioners and employees that's meaningful at the right time to make their lives easier and make their work experience better. Um, we have big efforts around big data and data analytics. And, uh, you know, all these things, I think, fall under that broad umbrella of digital transformation. And if transformation means continual evolution and driving forward, then yeah, we're going to be on a digital transformation for the foreseeable future. Um, if digital transformation, you know, is a radical shift, it's a little less relevant for ADP. You know, maybe if a car manufacturer goes from, you know, old fashioned car to a self-driving car, that's a big digital change. You know, for us, I think it's a little more evolutionary in the sense that, you know, as I've said multiple times, our systems are already all cloud-based. We're already, you know, we're already a technology company. These types of changes that you're describing, the different technologies, the different ways of thinking about these technologies and different and uh, developing technologies that match different types of HCM strategies. What does this do inside ADP? You mentioned DevOps and agile development. What are some of the implications for all of this in terms of ADP itself changing and, and adapting? Yeah. So excellent question. This is a, this is a not, this is not easy. This is, there's some heavy lifting inside ADP in the sense that um, we still have a lot of legacy applications um, and, you know, and, and moving those forward and moving our clients forward from legacy applications to our modern applications is not easy. It's disruptive for them and a lot of change. And the way we've attacked this problem is, um, we started by opening a new location uh, and our first location in, in Chelsea in Manhattan, we opened um, an innovation lab there. And we went out and purposely recruited all largely or 90% new people from outside. Um, and we went to Chelsea because it's, um, you know, sometimes referred to, I guess, as like Silicon Alley. It's, you know, close to the ad agencies. And we think it's the so there's a wealth of design capability to help us think through the user experience. And then we went through and recruited a lot of new talent into ADP that was, could help us, you know, help us think about how technology works and help us guide the future. And we've expanded that. We have a lab on the West Coast. We have one in Atlanta. So we use these labs to help kind of spark the thinking and um, help us, you know, with the, with the vision. And then... Uh, we have converted, as I said earlier, our whole R&D organization. I think we have 5,000 developers around the world. We're 100% agile. So then we take the ideas and the designs uh, and the, that we create in the labs, and then we permeate that throughout the whole organization. Um, and then the other thing I would add is our CEO uh, is in his fifth year in the job. He really set innovation out as a critical element for us the whole organization sort of is aligned behind this idea of innovation and he created you know both the strategy as well as the funding to help us move our teams forward so uh but it's a journey like everything it is a journey you mentioned uh working with startups and you've been talking about the innovation lab so can you talk uh describe a little bit more in depth this focus on innovation and how does such a large company ensure that innovation takes place on a constant, relentless, nonstop basis? Yeah, again, I, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, the, the, there's not really a magic wand for this, but what we've done is we've reserved a significant portion of our total investment in development. Uh, so, you know, roughly almost a quarter of our, of our R&D investment, we have on future stuff, future stuff being tomorrow's solutions, or, you know, like sometimes I like to say, Horizon 2 solutions and Horizon 3 solutions. So we reserve a significant amount of our budget with that, for that. And then we, you know, we try to recruit the talent that can help think through and build those. And then we leverage our 
global knowledge, our deep functional knowledge and our, our knowledge about global compliance to understand and our, our large client base to you know, try to get a pulse of what the needs are around our clients and, and what they're struggling with. Um, and then you know, we experiment. So, you know, I mentioned earlier leader compass, but, you know, we had this idea that we needed a lighter approach to help develop leaders. Uh, there's been lots of research done that suggests that, you know, frontline managers are the most important people in any organization. So they direct the troops, makes perfect sense, right? They direct the troops and almost everything is highly, a lot of things like associate engagement and associate productivity and um, associate satisfaction are tightly linked to the quality of their manager. So we said, that's a problem all of our clients have. And, uh, but we need a way to measure their, um, you know, their skills and their opportunities for development in an easier way, uh, in a lighter touch way. And then we need a way to help our clients develop them. And that's how we came up with this idea for Leader Compass based on behavioral economics. And I described it earlier, where we have these really light touch surveys and we get the responses and then we have the coach that based on the feedback that you got as an individual for you as a, a leader we could direct coaching to you and uh, we're going to roll this out more broadly and we believe that as we as we roll it out more broadly we'll learn so much about um, what it takes to coach and develop managers because we can run these surveys because it's so light and easy you know we're going to run them internally twice a year eventually we might run them quarterly and we'll be able to track the progress and then look at the coaching and see if the coaching is actually working in helping make managers more effective. And uh, we'll, as we roll this out to our clients, we'll get more data uh, holistically across the broad spectrum of clients that we serve. And we think we'll have even more insights. And you know, you know, our hope is that we can bring these insights and knowledge to our clients to help them be more effective in managing their human capital. That's really our, that's our strategy. If you see our tagline is a more human resource. You know, we really want to help our clients be more effective at managing their people so that they can be more effective in their individual businesses about driving business success and business results. In many large organizations, the, the one of the challenges of innovation is the senior leadership may have these goals, but as it filters down through the organization, people are used to doing things a particular way and they develop almost, you could say, the corporate anti-innovation antibodies. And yeah. so how do you prevent that from happening inside ADP? Yeah, um, so we have the benefit of having our CEO, as I mentioned, who is laser focused on the idea of innovation. And, um, you know, and he's, you know, and he keeps us pushing forward. He's, you know, he's concerned big companies, you know, there's a tendency in big companies to become bureaucratic and, um, you know, bureaucracy slows people down, but uh, he's done a really fantastic job in his tenure at, you know, getting a fall off, what I like to call is, you know, we used to be a little bit of a dashboard company, you know, we're always like, you know, what are the internal metrics and what are we doing, you know, into a windshield company. So, you know, head up, looking out forward and he's kept us focused more on the competition. And, you know, he, every day he's out talking about, you know, the avoidance of complacency and the avoidance of bureaucracy and the need to push forward more to beat our competition. And we're in a really competitive market. Um, and, you know, I said earlier, there's a ton of startups. And, um, you know, we see that and our associates see that. And I think he's done a really nice job about, you know, communicating our strategy and keeping our 56,000 associates around the world, you know, focused on moving forward. Now, now is it perfect, Michael? You know, nothing in the world is it's ever perfect as we know, but I feel pretty good about it. Uh, where we are and the progress that we're making. And I think our results show that. Uh, we just released our annual results. We had a great year. Uh, we sold almost, we saw, I guess, $1.75 billion of new HCM, uh, new business bookings. That's the annual revenue of our new clients. It's a 
tremendously large numbers as I'm sure people can appreciate. So we're really happy with that. And, uh, you know, and our overall business performance, you know, it's doing good and we feel good about where we are. Stuart, we have just five minutes left and we have a question from Twitter. Connie Woodson asks, how do you manage, how do you safely manage to document payroll, cloud-based payroll information, which I guess is part of the larger issue of safety in the cloud, especially at your scale and with the type of confidential information. So maybe can you talk about that issue and relatively briefly, because again, we only have a okay. few minutes left. Yeah, I mean, there's two aspects to payroll globally that are really hard. One is compliance, which is keeping track of all the changes that go on around the world. I think last year there were like 15,000 statutory changes. If you look across all the states and countries where we do business, so it's a huge number. And we have a team of statutory experts that monitor that around the globe so we can get that IP into our systems. And then, yeah, data security is a big focus and a big issue for us. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, all the standard defenses we focus on encryption at rest and we're constantly it's hand-to-hand -hand combat to keep our data secure and then on the global basis there's such big changes going on in data privacy regulation um, and this is an, again a big part of what we do for our clients um, and you know we have external auditors and um, you know we have ethical hackers that we work with so we have a Whole, we have a global security organization, a whole GSO, and their life is just trying to protect our data. But it is, uh, as it is for every company, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. You can't protect your perimeter defenses. It's impossible. People are in, so you got to encrypt data at rest, and you got to do things to make sure that you're protecting, you know, the crown jewels inside of, uh, inside the network. But um, that's a, that's probably Michael a topic that could be a whole topic for maybe another conversation because there's so much to it. And I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance to talk more about data analytics. I know we're out of time. It's another tremendous investment area for ADP. Uh, we have this data that we've accumulated literally over our 600,000 clients, you know, over the last 20 years, and we're trying to use that data to provide benchmarks and predictive analytics for our clients that help them again, manage their teams better, show them how their salaries, their increases, their turnover, their benefits costs compared to others. And then, you know, predictive analytics, our first one being flight risk to help them manage their employees better. So again, maybe we get a chance to talk again, that might be worth its whole subject on its own. Yes, well, we definitely, we, we should take just to, uh, a moment to, to talk a little further about this. So, uh, Data analytics, maybe just just tell us more. So you're aggregating data across from your millions of customers, many uh, vast amounts of data, and you have data scientists, I assume. So so please do elaborate a little bit on this. Yeah. So we take all we we have permission from our we got permission from our clients to take the data and anonymize, aggregate it in an anonymized fashion, and we have a team of data scientists, and they're working every day to provide insights back to our clients. One of the first things that we've done is benchmarks. It's relatively straightforward for us, and you can drill down our benchmarks literally by uh, industry and by state and to the position level. So if you want to know what a sales clerk, you know, makes in New Jersey on average, we can tell you that. Or if you want to know what a small business sales clerk earns in New Jersey, we can tell you that. And there's not real, there's not good data available in the market today. There's survey data, but we have real data. And you know, so we can show you that or what what's the turnover percent so you can compare your own statistics against your peer group and see if you might have a problem or, you know, what's the annual increase you're trying to set your, you know, the pool for an increase year over year. What are other companies doing so you can stay competitive in pay? So we have all the benchmarks and then the, that, that's the first thing we did. And the next thing we're doing is try to drive and develop predictive analytics. Uh, you know, I mentioned flight risk a few times and then you know, we could show you things like, you know, who's a good performer that's high flight risk, so you can take some action. And we're taking these metrics now and the benchmarks, and we're embedding them in the workflows so that at the right time, so if you're, you know, I use the example of visiting another location. If I'm going to visit and I'm going to do some meetings, you know, I should know, hey, who's, at, who's a high performer who's at risk so I can do something while I'm there. It's not every business shows up every day and, you know, say, oh, let me run some analytics. You know, let me see what's going on. 
So you try to embed them in the workflows. If you're doing a hire, you know, we tell you what the relative salaries are at that time, or when you open a new position, what the relative salaries are. So again, we're just trying to help our clients be more effective and leverage the, you know, aggregated and anonymized data that we have. And how important do you think this is going to be for your business um, moving forward? What kind of investments are you actually making? Yeah, we're making it's uh, it's one of, you know, when I mentioned, uh, you know, spending, you know, up to a quarter of our budget in, in innovation, this is part of that. And I think it's critically important that, yeah, I mean, I know you read, you know, you're, you, you follow technology closely. I'm sure a lot of listeners, big data is on the top of everyone's mind. And, you know, the nice thing about ADP is, as we like to say, in order to deliver big data, you actually have to have big data. And we have big data because we have the big, you know, we have the 600,000 clients globally and our average client, our average client tenure, I think our retention this year was 90%. So our average client life is like 10 years and we've been in the cloud forever. So we literally have, you know, years of historical data um, as well as the sum of the aggregated data. And it's actually really cool because as we try to create predictive analytics, we're able to go back in time. So we go back to the, you know, what the client looked like. So you go, oh, Stuart's at risk of turnover. And then, you know, we run the metrics on ADP five years ago. We said, oh, these people are at risk of turnover. And then we follow them forward in time and we can see if they actually leave or not. So we can see the, um, you know, sort of the effectiveness of our, the predictability of our metrics. Well, pretty interesting stuff. We have been talking on episode number 184 of CXO Talk with Stuart Sackman, who is one of the executives of ADP. Stuart, thank you again for taking time today to speak with us. Really appreciate it, Michael. It was a great conversation. Thanks for having me. And I hope, uh, hope uh, we got some tweets and we get some, uh, you know, if there's any other follow-ups, just great to have a chance to talk about it. Well, we have a lot of tweets and I hope you'll come back again. Everybody, thank you for watching. On Tuesday, we're speaking on CXO Talk with the CIO of VMware. And a week from today, next Friday, we're speaking with the CEO of Dale Carnegie. And so that'll be interesting. So everybody, thanks so much and have a great week. Bye-bye.